morning, my name is Peter de Toy and welcome to News 24's offices in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, where I'm joined by News 24's special, specialist correspondent, Mandy Wiener. Good morning, Mandy, to talk about the Pete Mihalik assassination yesterday. Quite a dramatic day, Mandy. Uh, you're a you're a, you're an author of of the well known book uh, Ministry of Crime. You know that that the underworld very well. Um, it was quite a shock when we all got the news, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely, Peter. I think that it was a shock because, uh, firstly, there was no warning about this. We didn't uh, we didn't expect it um, at all. A and also, it was the nature of the way that it was done. Um, the fact that that Pete Mahalik was shot while dropping his kids off at school. Uh, that it was it was so public mm. and so brazen mm. um, and so blatant that it happened outside of school and that his eight-year-old son was wounded as well. And I think a lot of people in the legal community, uh, but also in the criminal underworld, are reeling uh, from from the the way that it was mm. done. You know, mm. I've spoken to some people who who said that they are very very unhappy about uh, the way that this was carried out and, and the fact that the son was injured as well. So we're going to dive into all the nitty-gritty of the underworld and the impact of Mihalik's death. Uh, News 24's team was on the scene very early yesterday morning. Let's have a look at what the neighbours had to say on the scene. And I was about to drive out and I heard um, two gunshots. So I looked over there and I saw, the I saw like a big silver gun. And then the guy just... I mean, it actually almost looked like a toy gun because he was so calm about it. And then he just started walking and he had like a briefcase or something, something he had and he put the gun behind it to hide it. And then he just walked, like quickly, but no, he didn't even run. Okay, and then the daughter got out and started screaming for an ambulance. Uh, apparently there was a car there and he got in and he drove off. Mandy, uh, we, we spoke about the violent, uh, the, the, the aspect of violence, the, the extreme violence that was used in this incident. You, we, we spoke about the school. We just saw the footage of Redham House School. It's quite an exclusive school in Greenpoint. How brazen are these gangsters? I mean, Mihalik was, just give us a little bit of background of Mihalik self. Uh, he was quite a prominent criminal lawyer and advocate in Cape Town. Uh, you know, he lived in an exclusive suburb in Muli Point in in, 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 uh, uh, in Cape Town as well. His children went to an exclusive school, dropping off your kids at school, and then the brazen attack, one or two shots through the window. It was it was dramatic, but it was brazen, and it was quite violent. So Pete Mahalik was uh, a very well-regarded and well-known um, advocate in, in Cape Town. He was very much one of the go-to guys as a criminal defense advocate. Um, and he was, he was well-liked amongst his peers. Many people I've spoken to spoke about what a good lawyer he was, what a good legal mind, uh, and what a good guy he was as well. Uh, he, he drove a, you know, a fancy mm. Mercedes-Benz. Uh, as you say, he lived in Really Point, and, and he moved in those circles mm. as mm. well. Uh, and I think that's why it's, it's so shocking. Um, but if you look at the brazenness you know we, we are shocked by the fact that it was it was done outside of school and then his, son and his was children injured. were in the car exactly but if you look back to for example the murder of brian wainstein who uh, was known as the steroid king he was shot in his bed with his his wife and child uh who were also there with him who witnessed it uh, if you go back to uh 2007 2008 to yuri the russian who who was shot his four-year-old daughter was killed uh, in, in that shooting as well when he was taken out. Um, so, so these things, unfortunately, have happened in the past. Does this, is this designed to send a message to someone? Is this designed to uh, uh, be a marker in the ground almost? Is this part of a turf war? Because surely, um, you know, shootings, you know, you, you've spoken about previous incidents that were as brazen as this one. But still, shooting someone on a Tuesday morning outside of a school, uh, dropping off the kids, is this designed to send out a message? Or what's the what's the symbolism behind this? I, I can't say conclusively, but I mean, I can tell you what it looks like. Yes. And and from for the people I've been speaking to, what they've been saying, and they certainly think it's designed for to get the media attention and to send a message. They, they could have shot him when he was driving into his chambers. Everybody knows, mm. you know, mm. where, where he works. Or his house. Uh, or his really house, now. for example. So to, to shoot him when he's dropping off his kids, I mean, that can only be designed to get the maximum impact. Um, so, so I would imagine that would be the case. Uh, you know, so, so that obviously is concerning. And it could be that they want to send a message because they, they, there is this, this turf war, mm. although they don't like to call it that, mm, mm. that has been going on in Cape Town between a more established grouping uh, that runs nightclub security and a, a new grouping, which, which uh, Pete Mahalik was, was pretty much aligned to. You know, he represented Colin Boyce and, and Nafiz Modak um, in their bail application in, mm. in an extortion matter. So, so it could be because of that. It also 
also could be because of you know some um, other case that he was involved in. We just mm. don't know at this stage. Uh, the obvious assumption is that it has to do with this turf war, but it could be with another case that, that we just don't know about. You refer to this turf war. Can you give us the lay of, just a little bit, elaborate a little bit more on the lay of the land in the Cape Town gang environment? Um, why is it so important to get hold or get control of of the of the of the security industry or the private security uh, industry at clubs. What's the what's the is, is it a lucrative business? Is there a lot of money in it? Why why is this such a, a bone of contention? So if you go back, you know, and and this is very similar to what was happening in Joburg in in the late 1990s, early 2000s with the elite group in, in nightclubs. Uh, he who controls the door controls the drug trade. Okay. So often it's got to do with that um, that they want to control security so they can control the drug trade. Mm. Uh, the other suggestion is that it has to do with, with extortion. So the allegation against Nafiz Modak and, and his associates when during the bail application was that they would go to business owners in Cape Town and in Joburg and they would say to them, you have to pay us 20, 30, 40 grand a month. Protection uh, money. Protection money. And if you don't, we'll come in uh, with our heavies and we'll terrorize your patrons. And the business owners, rather than have trouble, would mm. pay over this monthly retainer. Uh, so that was the allegation against them, and that's, that trial's coming up. They, of course, completely deny that. Mm. Um, Nafiz Modak, uh, in an interview with me, said that there is no extortion, um, but he wants to go. He was going into clubs to try and take over security from Mark Lifman and Andre Nordia because uh, he wants to clean up the drugs and clean up mm. the, the nightclubs in, in Cape Town. So, 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 where does this, wh where do these turf wars play out? Does it play out in the clubs? Does it play out in the Cape Flats? Wh where does it physically play out? Are there are there enough clubs in Cape Town, Sea Point area, those types of areas where where the drug trade uh, really does well? Wh where does this, where do these turf wars play out? So, over the past year or so, we have seen some shootings that have happened in in Cape Town at various clubs. Um, there, there was a shooting in Camps Bay. Mm. There was a shooting in. Uh, in Stellenbosch, um, where there has been yes. collateral damage, where, mm. where people have been killed. Um, so there is that, but then there's also the targeted hits. So there have been a number of attempts to kill Jerome Donkey Boyson. Mm. There have been a number of, of attempts to kill Colin Boyson, mm. um, who, of course, just to place that in context, are two Boyson brothers, who the alleged leaders of, of the sexy gangs, who fall on either side of this. So Colin Boyson is with Nafiz Modak, and Jerome Donkey mm. Boyson is, is with Mark Lifman. Um, and they've been split. So, so there are these targeted attempts where, where we see people trying to, to assassinate one another. Um, and then, of course, more concerning for the public is the, the incidents that happen in public spaces. In like the clubs. one in Stellenbosch, for example, where students were killed, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 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 yes, yeah. a, mother, a mother was killed. Yeah. yeah so, so there are those because that is always the concern about the collateral damage. But place Mahalik for us in, in this turf war. Um, you wrote yesterday that he sometimes represented... Uh, people from different mm. sides of the divide in an attempt to try and bridge the gap. Um, try and place him for us in, 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 this, in this saga. So it's understood that, that Pete Mahalik did try and play something of a peacemaker role, that he tried to, to mediate between the two sides. But he, he represented Nafiz Modak and, and Colin Boyson. And when Modak was arrested on the extortion uh, charges last year, Mahalik actually couldn't represent him. He had to hand over the case to Bruce Hendricks because Mahalik himself was implicated. And what happened when the investigating officer took the stand was that he alleged that Mahalik was acting as a, as a facilitator, mm. as a mediator. And the way he described it, uh, Mahalik would reach out to wealthy Jewish business owners, that's the way it was described, mm. who would come into his chambers and then the heavies would come in, allegedly, and would say to them, oh, you've got to pay us a retainer, and Mahalik would be the, the facilitator. However, that was completely backpedaled. The prosecutor then stood up in court and said, actually, this is not relevant, mm. and there's a lot of mudslinging going on here, and that's not true. And Mahalik denied it, and Modak denied it. Um, but that, that allegation stuck. The other allegation was around a firearm. Now, this firearm was stolen during... Um, a standoff that happened at an auction in Paro mm. in 2017, which was really the catalyst for this turf war. And the allegation was that Mihalik had this firearm and that he demanded a, a, like a ransom payment, a 20,000 rand payment, from Brian Weinstein, who was known as, as the steroid king, to come in and pay to get this firearm. And, and Mihalik absolutely denied that as well. So, so that's where he kind of fits in to, to this whole scenario. Do we have any 
idea why Mahalik was t- uh, taken out yesterday? Do we have any idea around motive or, or, or who might have done this? There's a lot of speculation at the moment, so we don't know for sure who, who was responsible. Um, we know that the police have taken in, as I understand it, two people mm. for, for questioning, and one is, is due to appear in court. Um, from reports, it seems as though they are professional hitmen. Uh, that they may have flown in from KZN and then rented a vehicle that had uh, and then put f- uh, false number plates on mm, it mm. Um, and that they are hired hitmen. Mm, the mm. question is who hired the hitmen? Mm. And, and that's the key. Was Mahalik involved in... Uh, was there a current court case going on where he was involved which might give us an indication? So uh, th- there are a few that, that could reveal a link. The other high-profile court case that, that has raised questions is one involving a, a massive... In Cape Town. In Cape Town. And they were used in over a thousand murders. And there was a very high profile court case going on uh, involving mm. stolen guns. Mm. Um, and two years ago, Nuruddin Hassan, who was an attorney who worked very closely with Rashid Mahalik, was shot in very similar circumstances in his car out, pa- outside his house in, in Langa. So at the time, Mahalik was interviewed in the media saying how devastated he was. And then Mahalik actually took over that case. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, you know, the, that is the suggestion that that case perhaps could have been... Let's talk about uh, 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 gang violence in, in, in Cape Town generally, and then we can we can bring it up to, to, to Gauteng. Um, ha- have, has gang violence, the, 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 the gang culture, the whole... Uh, factional fighting in Cape Town escalated over the last couple of years? Um, or has it been a constant problem uh, in, 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 in the recent past? So it is beginning and slow, depending on the, the politics. There have been um, kind of long uh, periods of time where there's been stability. Um, you know, but it has been, it has been pretty lengthy um, over a period of time. And then we'll have moments where there is a flurry of, of violence. So, for example... In the years uh, when Cyril Bierke mm. and Red Security, uh, when, when he was running Cape Town, things were very stable and it was calm mm. and he kind of unified it. Mm. And then uh, there was a period when he was moved out of Cape Town uh, and then he was killed. And then for a period of time, there, there was, w- was again violence. So it depends on what's going on in, in the politics. And in, in, in many ways, what's happening in Cape Town now is the, the long-term effect of Cyril Bierke being killed in 2011 because the guys linked... He was a stabilizing force, a stabilizing factor. In, in, in some ways, yeah. yes. So, so what happened was Cyril Bierke was killed and Nafiz Modak was very close to Cyril Bierke, as was Jacques Cronier, and for a period of time, they went away. Yeah. And in late 2016, 2017, they decided to, to come back again and, and try and take over from... Uh, from the more established grouping, it's it's pretty violent, isn't it? I mean, the violence that they perpetrate it's 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 not a hit and, uh, you know it's not uh, it's not random crime that we're used to up here in Joburg, I suppose, for example. Uh, these are pretty violent characters. Um, y- look, I mean, to be clear, they haven't been convicted of of anything, yeah. um, so it's, it's difficult to say. Like a lot of it is reputational, um, but if you look at at the way that it works, often what happens is they don't perpetrate the violence themselves. Mm. Um, it would be perpetrated by, I- in this case, with Pete Mahalik, it's a hired hitman. Mm. It's a hitman who's paid. Um, we've seen uh, the attempts on Jerome Donkey Boyce and also have been assassins mm. who've been paid to come in and, and perpetrate the violence. Um, it is very violent. So like if you look at what happened to, to, to Weinstein, for example, it was incredibly violent. Um, you know, If you look at what happened to Cyril Bierke and Yuri the Russian, they are assassinations, and and they are cold-blooded murders. And there's lots of money involved. Yeah, I, I'm in the drug trade, in the drug trade yeah. definitely. You know, I mean that's th- that's it's a multi-million rand, billion rand industry. Um, and in fact, Mahalik's father said that he thinks that the murder could have been about money. Mm-hmm. Um, and often that's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, is is money. Mandy, um, yesterday was a great focus on Cape Town's underworld, but you you've got quite an affinity for for the Joburg underworld as well. Are there links, similarities between the Cape Town underworld and the Joburg underworld, or are these two totally separate universes almost? 
the short answer is I don't know. Uh, and and there there has been a lot of chatter about you know is this linked to what's been happening in Joburg? Is it not? Uh, a few years ago, when Radovan Kreitzer was involved in in Joburg and, and and pretty much running things here, um, then there was much more of a of an established link to to Cape Town. And this, I'm not sure if, if what happened with Pete Mahalik is in any way linked mm -hmm. to the Serbians that are taking each other out in Joburg because. We've had a series of shootings in Joburg over the past few months where we've had Serbian uh, individuals who have some kind of history in paramilitary organizations linked to organized crime, who've been shot in traffic, in rush hour traffic, in their vehicles, um, and quite blatantly and quite openly, and, and no one's been arrested for, for any of those. Um, so that's happening in Joburg. We've, we've seen what happened now with Pete Mahalik in Cape Town. I have no idea if they're linked or not. But what it does highlight is crime intelligence mm -hmm. and the fact that there just doesn't seem to be any intelligence around these assassinations and that they aren't stopped before they happen, that the sources aren't there, and they're not able to, to arrest anyone. Although in Cape Town they have now arrested people for, for Mahalik. Why is, why is crime intelligence, our crime intelligence unit, uh, SAPS's crime intelligence unit, um, such a big uh, boon for, for the gangs? Why, 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 is the, uh, why is it so important for them to uh, to make hay while crime mm. intelligence is, is in such a, a dire state. So we know that crime intelligence over the past ten years or so has been largely eviscerated because of the the capture of of the police by organised crime and by political um, factions as well. So uh, th unfortunately, there just isn't the the sourcing that that's going on so that we need so that people aren't being arrested. The other issue that you've got is that. It's such a grey area because so many of the individuals that are uh, major kingpins in organised crime are working for the cops as sources. Um, so there are allegations that Nafiz Modak is a police source, mm -hmm. which he denies. Mm -hmm. There are allegations that Mark Lifman is a police source. Um, you know, if you go back, uh, any of these individuals who who have been linked, they are all informants for the police. And what happens then is because they're informants, they're protected. Mm -hmm. So Cyril Bierke is the perfect example of this. He, um, by all accounts, worked for state security. So if he was ever involved in anything vaguely illegal and, the f and, and one arm of the police was investigating him and wanted to arrest him, his handlers at state security would swoop in and say, no, you can't have him. He's one of ours. He gives us information, so he's not going to be prosecuted. Um, and then at the same time, you've got a whole lot of senior police officers that are accused of working for organized crime. So it gets very blurred, and the blue line gets thinner and thinner. So crime intelligence is not functioning as it should? Uh, it, it's my belief that it's not. Um, I think that I am encouraged by the fact that Peter Jacobs has taken over at crime intelligence. It's ended a long period of instability where Richard Mbluli was suspended and earned 12 million rand uh, on Just suspension for, for eight years, yeah. including a performance bonus for sitting at home. Um, so the fact that Peter Jacobs has taken over and also that he, I mean, he, he comes from, uh, from, from Cape Town, he comes from um, the int an intelligence background, uh, that, that is encouraging. And also there is this new anti-gang unit that's mm. being set up um, ostensibly under Jeremy Vieri in, in Cape Town. And this will be a real test for them. Um, th they haven't officially been launched yet, as I understand it. But it's yeah, it's supposed to happen this week. So this is going to be a real test for them. Um, and it's going to be a real test to see whether or not um, they are able to, to break through. Um, as I understand it, the investigating officer now in the Mahalik case is the same investigating officer that made the allegations against Mahalik. So, some so there could potentially be an, an area of conflict there. Man, in closing, um, not uh, you know, don't want to put you on the spot, but what do you expect uh, after yesterday's murder? Do you, do you, do you foresee uh, that there might be an escalation in violence, retribution, uh, how do these things normally play out, and how do you think they should play out? I, I'm, I'm concerned that there could be retaliation. Um, from some of the people I was speaking to yesterday, they say that they are very concerned there could be chaos now because people are so upset about the way that it was done, that he was shot outside of school and his son was, was wounded. So there is always a concern about retaliation, that there could be a tit-for-tat uh, revenge killings. Um, but again, it comes down to motive and who was responsible for this. Uh, so police are going to have to step in and intervene and make sure that there isn't an escalation in violence because then they, they run the risk of losing control.
that Mandy Wiener needs to record specialist uh, reporter and also the author of Ministry of Crime. Follow News 24 for all the breaking news around the Mahalik murder. And let's see if we can figure out why he was murdered and what's coming next.